When I was nine years old, I made two major decisions. One of them was a great decision. The other one, not so much. <laughs> but at age nine, influenced by John F. Kennedy, as she talked about the Kennedy Center at Harvard, when he asked us to ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. At age nine, I made the decision that I wanted to work for an organization that wanted to change the world and was not motivated by profit. Second, I didn't even know what nonprofits were. I just knew that was my goal. The second one was, based on Perry Mason, I decided to be a lawyer to accomplish that nonprofit work. Luckily, my father got me a job working in a law firm my junior and senior year of high school. And I realized that Perry Mason was a horrible model for choosing law as a profession. So I came to Brigham Young University not sure what I wanted, still knowing I wanted to help change the world, but not motivated by my profit. And I got my degree in political science, the second most worthless degree in the world. Second only to that one that changes its name every five years. When I was here, it was called General Studies. It's the degree that when you have changed majors so many times, you have so many credits, they just want you gone. That's the only one worse than political science. I left here and I went to the U U University of Southern California Master's in Public Administration program. And I was so excited, I had, I'd arranged a job, I had gotten a job as the assistant to the assistant city manager, sounds like something from the office, doesn't yeah. it? <laughs> to the assistant to the assistant city manager for the city of Beverly Hills. I was in my dream school and I had a great job with one tiny caveat. There was this pesky initiative called Proposition 13 on the ballot. And if Proposition 13 passed, Beverly Hills would not hire me. If it did not pass, then I was a shoe in but they wouldn't let me start till the election. We graduated in April, we had till June. Proposition 13 passed, reducing property rates from 12% to 2% across all of California. And it was supposed to be a bellwether change that would cross the country. I wanted to be a city manager and had just entered that world when a 12-year recession in public administration began. Luckily, I was able to get a job working for a crook <laughs> in one of the most immoral offices I have ever worked in. And I got made the manager. It was a headhunting company in Los Angeles. And one day, one of the people quit, and I was determined, after a year and a half of filth, that I was going to hire one person who would be as moral as I was. So I went down to the LDS Employment Resource Center to hire a headhunter. And in the process, submitted my own resume, not knowing that they were hiring a manager right then. And they hired me away from the crook, and I started a 37-year career working for the LDS church, changing the world one person, one family at a time, through employment and education and self-employment. I'm here to talk about mid-career job changes. Now that's me. You've seen it. Good. Pass on it. <laughs> we're going to talk about three things tonight. First, we're going to talk about creating your dream job and identifying your dream job. Next, we're going to talk about what management and what decision makers are looking for. What you have to convince them of for them to promote you, give you a bigger raise, or to hire you. And finally, we're going to talk about how 
your master's in public administration fits into that world. Then hopefully we'll have some Q&A afterwards. Is that okay? Okay, I have a quick exercise I would like to do. I need two volunteers. And I just, can I have two volunteers real quick? Come on up. Thank you, you two. Come on up. Come over here. There is a prize. The first prize was candy, and I forgot I was teaching this twice, and I only brought one. <laughs> so you don't get candy, you get money. <laughs> don't you love it? I'm trying to motivate you with money. Yes, then you can buy there. It is. Okay, so that's it. Stand over here. Okay, you are going to be in a race. The first person who can get to the destination. Okay, stand over here, Mike. Stand over here. First one who gets to the destination gets the prize. Ready? Yeah. On your mark, get set, go. Good, he gets the prize. Okay. Walk away from the table. City manager. Okay, read them yours. Walk away from the table. What yours say? Walk to the light switch. Question. Did they both do what they were told to do? Yes. So they both get part of the money. I hadn't thought about that. But. Since you learned more, you get the three, he gets the two. <laughs> Talk to me, which is easier? Walking from the table or walking to the light when there is an actual destination that you have to get to? Walking to the light. Which is easier? Yeah, which is easier. Walking away from the table is easier. You don't have to do anything. But you never made it to the light. Um, yeah, you didn't ask me to go there, so sorry, I was being literal. <laughs> now, the reason I bring this up is most people do what she was told to do. They are unhappy where they're, you two can sit down by the way. Thank you. They're unhappy where they're at. It may be they're unhappy with their boss, they're unhappy with the organization, it may be they're unhappy with the job, and they just want to get out of there. And they are walking away from something, but they don't have any clue where they're headed. <laughs> is it easier to walk away or to walk to something? Which is more satisfying? Walking to something. So what we're going to talk about is making sure that you are walking to something. And what we're going to talk about is companies write job descriptions so that they can analyze applicants to pick the right applicant. Does that make sense? They describe what they want done, they describe the skills, they describe what they're looking for, and then every person who applies, they compare to that to find what they think is the best one. My suggestion to you is do the same thing. You write a dream job description that outlines what you really want so that you are walking to that dream job. And then you use it to compare all the opportunities that come your way. One of the things we find in today's world is so many people wind up leaving a job they hate and winding up in one that's worse because they didn't do this. So you write your description, and what we're suggesting is there are six parts to this description. And by the way, I have the uh, worksheet you can use. I'll send it to you for free if you'll send an email. And in the subject line, put EMPA, night, and dream job. And I'll email it back to you. I won't charge you anything. Okay? The, the six parts of a, of a job, these are the six essential elements, are first, the duties, tasks, and responsibilities. You have to outline what it is you want to do, not what you are good at. I talk to people all the time, and, and they say, I want a new job, and I say, what do you want to do? And guess what they tell me? What they did. And then they wonder why they're always unhappy. Because when I say, what do you want to do, they don't know. 
So start with what are the tasks you love to do? What are the things that you are really good at and you love to do? And then at the very bottom you put the things you're really good at and you hate to do. <laughs> I had a guy, he, he defined himself as a finance guy. And everywhere he went, he said, we said, what do you do for a living? He said, I'm a finance guy. So anyone want to guess what kind of jobs he always got? <laughs> finance. He hated finance. The only reason he was a finance guy is everyone in his family was a finance guy and every time he told them he wanted to do something different they'd say, oh that's silly, we're finance people. So he grew up that that was silly. Well we finally got him to redefine it. You want to hear how he defined who he was now? He said, I'm one of those people who can look at a process, whether it's an assembly line of tangible process, process paperwork or thought processes, I can look at processes and identify the bottlenecks. And I can manage the team to remove those bottlenecks. For example, at XYZ Company, I identified one bottleneck. We assembled a team of 26 people that I supervised. It took us 18 months to resolve that bottleneck. But when we were done, we increased revenues by $400 million a year. Okay. Russ, is that what you'd like in your company? Yeah. <laughs> so you define what you love to do and you put it down in number one. Number two, you look at the industry you want to work in. Does industry impact a job? Can I show you how? Let's use managing people. Is that okay? This is someone who is a manager. Now, I want you to picture in your minds the manager in a banking or investment institution. Can you picture that person? See what they're wearing. See the environment they're working in. Now, a manager in a manufacturing environment. Is it the same picture? Has it changed? Even though they're doing the same duties, has it changed the job. And now third, picture that same person, a manager in food service. Do you see how the industry changes what you're doing? You're going to be looking at industries, and those industries may be the uh, medical industry, the education industry, the humanitarian. There are lots of industries, and you'll look at those. The next one that you're going to look at is the size. Big core organizations, mid-sized organizations, small organizations, startup organizations. What is the difference between doing the job in a big company versus a small one? In a small one, you do more than just the job description. In a small one, you're doing more, more variety, right? What happens in a big company? You're a cog. You're a cog. You're in a little tiny box, and you're doing just that. So you have to look at what do you want to be. And a lot of people say, well, there's more stability in big companies. Well, who's laying off more, big companies or small companies? Big companies. The next one is ownership. Who owns the organization? Are you working, do you want to work for an organization that is owned by stockholders? You want to work for an organization that's owned by a private individual. A lot of people say, well, stockholders and private individuals define the size. No. Larry H. Miller is a privately held company. Are they a big company? Yes. yes. So there's private, there's stockholder, there is self-ownership. There is ownership by we the people. What organizations are owned by we the people? At least in theory. Government. Governments. And the last one is those organizations that have no ownership. Which organizations, by law, cannot have an owner? Nonprofits. Nonprofits. So in your description, you write what kind of company ownership you want to work for. You want to work for a private, a stockholder, uh, yourself. The next part is location, both geographic and locale. And then the final one is you define the environment. The physical layout. What do you want in a physical layout? Do you want to work where everyone has their own office? Do you want to work where it's all cubicles? Do you want to work where they build collaborative team uh, settings? Next is the culture. 
What culture do you want to work for? I told you, I started working for a crook. This guy was so bad, he kept on his desk the book, Winning Through Intimidation, <laughs> on the corner facing whoever came into the office. He literally had sawed off a quarter inch on both of the front legs of the chairs in his office. That was the culture. Next is the style, leadership style. Do they still have you go through your leadership styles? Um, how many of you have ever taken the time to find out the leadership style of your future boss, either when you're going for a promotion or you are going to look for a new job, that you have done the due diligence on the leadership style of the person you are going to work for? How many of you have ever, congratulations, give her a hand. How many of you have ever worked for a boss you really hated? Raise your hand. Or you did not like working for? Raise your hand. These are things you should define ahead of time. Now, are you going to get all of them? Probably not. But can you get more of them because that's what you're comparing every opportunity to? You're holding up your ideal and you're saying, how close is this? Any questions on that? Okay, let's go to the next part. And by the way, do you notice I have my agenda at the bottom of my PowerPoint? I learned that here. <laughs> yes? How in the world are you supposed to find out their leadership style? You ask them that. You ask people who work for them. You ask people in the organization. Most people are so busy going out and talking about themselves they never take the time to ask questions before. They're, they're networking for most people who are looking for a job is a people chase. It should be an information chase. Prepare questions that help you find that out. You can ask them in emails, you can ask them in. Okay, next we're going to go to expectations. Companies and people you are going to work for or are working for basically have three things that you have to do or you're going to lose. First, they want someone who can do the job they want done and more. If you want to get ahead, if you want to get put on the right committees, if you want to get a promotion or the biggest raise in the range that they give, these are the three things you have to do. First, do the job they want based on productivity, efficiency, effectiveness, and quality. Second, you have to fit into the organization had a guy that uh, he carpooled with me and every day he was on, at the job at quarter to eight, he worked here at BYU, he was working for a professor that was doing some amazing research on drones. And he was here at quarter to eight and he was gone by quarter after five. Every single day. Perfect, right? Everyone else on the team got there at about 11 o'clock and left at seven. When that entire team decided to commercialize the product and take what they had done here at BYU and form a company, guess who was the only one not invited to the team? Because he never fit in. He did what he thought was right, and it didn't matter what anyone else did. Finally, you have to have a good return on investment. You have to communicate that return on investment, even in nonprofits. Okay? So these three things are what you have to communicate if you want to get ahead. Communicate your return. I suggest this. Find out first, and by the way, how many are working for a company that have clearly communicated to you what their expectations are? Raise your hand. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Another set of questions you need to start asking. Start asking. What is your expectation on my productivity? What is your expectation on my effectiveness, on my efficiency, and on the quality of my work? And then create a graph, either in Excel or whatever you want to use, and start monitoring those things on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis, depending on how your business is. Does that make sense? Start keeping track, and then, Communicate to them what you have done that month 
to improve either the productivity, the efficiency, the effectiveness, or the quality in a short statement. Do they still teach PAR statements? Problem, action, result? You prepare a PAR statement once a month and you communicate it to management. You communicate. This was, you mentioned to me you were concerned about this problem in our IT group. And this was the idea that I had and I implemented it and as a result the number of bugs in our system decreased by 30 percent. Is that what you wanted? And look what her head is doing involuntarily. Could you see it? What was her head doing? Isn't this what you want your boss to do? And so you communicate that. We're going to talk about how to do that. Any questions on this concept? Yes? So is it when waiting to be told something that you need to be improved on, or is it something that you just do? You can look for it and walk up and say, always ask permission before you do something, but you can walk up and say, hey, I noticed this, and I had this thought about it. Would it be okay if I tried that and see what it does? You don't wait for them. You can also proactively go for it. Good question. Thank you. Any others on that? <coughs> okay. When we do that, now we come to this. Does a degree satisfy management's expectations? Now remember the expectations. Can you do the job? Are you going to fit in? And are you a good return on investment? Does a degree satisfy any of that? No. No. But here's what I want you to do anyway. All of you go home tonight, no matter if you're first year, second year, or third year. Go to your LinkedIn profile, and after your name, put the initials MPA. And if you're first year, put MPA, what year you get your second year. You're going to come when? First. You're first. So when do you hope to get your degree? 2021. So you put MPA 2021 in parentheses. Put it on your business cards. Put it on your profiles. Use it. But realize the degree is not going to get you a job. Okay? However, and I love this. This was from Rex Facer in our capstone class. And it's changed my life. He said, it's not important to receive a master's of public administration. The important thing is to be a master public administration. Now how does being a master fit into doing the job, fitting in and providing an ROI? How does the fact that you have mastered, what is it you have mastered to be that? And what I submit is you have mastered a set of tools, experiences, and things. In our group, they, had to they told us during the capstone to write a journal, journaling our experience. Because of Rex's statement, I titled mine, My Path to Be a Master of Public Administration. In it, it has a section. Here is a section of all the tools that I learned in my MP EMPA program. And I have the backup for these, except I did lose my spreadsheet on PROACT. I was really sorry because I can't remember how to do. I use these tools. And I tell my bosses when I'm using them. We did a PROACT analysis of <coughs> this new market niche. And based on this analysis, we've made these decisions. Is that all right with you? And then we come back and we say, based on that decision and the implementation, we have increased our productivity overall by 23% this year. Is that the result you were looking for? You're a master of the tools that they teach you. You can become a master of the books. You can become a master of what you've learned about yourself. This reflected Bell self-portrait. Did they, they, I understand they don't have you do this anymore. This was such a great tool that I used to draft my dream job because it told me those, those top three things that I had to do. 
Claire, yes. We, we do do that. I, we did it last night. Reflected best self. Is yes, reflected best self through the University of Michigan. Good. So you did do it. Yeah. We did, Excellent. Well, it's, we did like a calling map. Calling map. Yeah. Calling like, map. That's a little different. A little different. Like the then you take the results of that, and that's what you put in the first part of your ideal job description. I've got to finish. Then you communicate your return on investment in one-on-one -on -one conversations with your supervisor, your manager. You communicate it by emails or you communicate it with cards. You pick a different one each month. This month I'm going to do it verbally. The next month I'm going to do it in a handwritten card. The next month I'm going to send an email. And then you put it in your performance appraisal. At the end of the year when you're doing your performance appraisal, you take all of the 12 of the ones you did and that's what you put in the column that says, what did you do this year? Now they've heard it once. They've seen it in the document. Especially, make sure that your document, your statements always include percentages or dollars. What you did to save money, what you did to increase money, what you did to increase percentage of people involved. And if you will do that, if you will do the job they want, monitor your progress, fit into the team and communicate your return on investment, you will find yourself getting on the best assignments, the best committees, the biggest raises. Any questions? We have just a couple of minutes. What do you do for work? Uh, I used to work for the LDS Church, working for an organization. You said you crafted your dream job. Are you doing your dream job? Or? I'm doing my dream job. I retired from working for the church after 37 years, and I am now a professional trainer, author, and online course facilitator. And I just went to Disney World three weeks ago for a job, and I'm going to Disney World in June, June for a job, and I went to Hawaii last year for a job. It's really neat going to places that you really would love to go to and have someone else pay for it. <laughs> She's here telling me because she knows me so well that it's time to end. Congratulations, go for it.